Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everybody. Oh, boy, am I relieved to see that there is no echo blaring at me. You guys have no idea what the hell that I went through last week with that echo coming out of my computer. It's a good thing I'm uh, not having to deal with that now. Hey, uh, might as well just let me know in the chat room if you can hear me. But anyway, now that I know that that's not going to be an issue, um, I am your host, Andrew Fisher. It is December 11th, 2013. This is Nature of Reality Radio, broadcasting live from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And tonight on the show, we have Cosmic Gaia Sophia. Perfect label to give her. It's the only appropriate label. There's other labels like Whistleblower and all, but I think Cosmic Gaia Sophia is the perfect label for Laura Magdalene Eisenhower great-granddaughter of Dwight D., and a fascinating individual. We'll be talking about some very interesting stuff there. And also her lover, Dr. Dream, will be on the uh, show tonight. I get to kill two birds with one stone. As a matter of fact, I remember them well from first I met them. I actually don't remember Dr. Dream from the Free Your Mind conference in Philly, but I do remember Laura. She was nice enough to answer me about half a dozen questions and uh, loved her presentation also watch Alfred Weber's presentation and uh, some other guy who I don't remember. Wish I could have gone to all uh, the events there. But I also met them at the In 5D Return to Atlantis conference. Wonder if they'll know who I am as soon as I uh, let them on the show. But other than that, it's great to uh, great to be speaking to them again. That beach collectivation on the Quartz Crystal Sand of Sarasota during that In 5D Return to Atlantis conference was something else. That that event felt great. There was also one in Philly. Didn't get to go to that one, unfortunately. But for letting them on, might as well get started with the news. Let's see what we got here. Oh, NYPD held mall terrorism exercise after the Kenya attack. Well, it's almost uh, in your face evidence that that Kenyan mall attack was no accident. It was staged by New World Order forces to justify tyranny. Lookalike drill happening shortly thereafter really does make you wonder. And the thing about that Kenya Mall attack, it actually happened on the the day of the wind, uh, excuse me, the fall equinox. And I actually remember that day pretty well because I called into the Alex Jones show that day to uh, play the role of citizen whistleblower. I guess I might as well uh, talk about this. It's actually very appropriate because of what's going to be going on in, in three days, the one-year anniversary of the Sandy Hook massacre. That event was so a false flag. I mean, first of all, how do you know Adam Lanza didn't do it? Well, Social Security death indexes from at least three sources said that he died the day before Sandy Hook. So how could he have uh, how could he have done the shooting? He couldn't. He couldn't have been there unless his dead body was there. There's actually some evidence to suggest that um, that is what actually happened. They dumped his body there. There's one documentary, I believe it's called Sandy Hook Documentary, which I recommend giving out to as many people as possible. Uh, the last uh, hour or so of that documentary actually covers uh, why they want to take our guns to tyrannize us. Lose the Second Amendment, you lose everything. I'll say it once, I'll say it again. It bears repeating. I actually got myself a new belt buckle that says the right to bear arms in front of an American flag. Very appropriate belt buckle. If I was in Congress, I'd probably wear that every single day to uh, in Congress just to show Congress that the American people have that right. But in regards to why I called into Alex Jones show that day, the fact is uh, in my local newspaper, um, about a couple weeks after the Sandy Hook massacre happened, I saw that some local police departments were going to change the way they do their jobs because they believed the official story of Sandy Hook. By the way, there was a lookalike drill happening of a school shooting at another school at the exact same time Sandy Hook ha- happened. The probability of that happening is one in a hundred gazillion. It, it, too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. So false flag evidence. But point is, I went to those police departments to tell them that you have been had. The official story is a lie. Evidence shows government state Sandy Hook to justify taking our Second Amendment right to bear arms. And um, a couple of police departments actually were very interested in listening to me. One actually had a cop that was like, yo, buddy, you missed your medication. I think you're a lunatic. And I told him, no, really, this isn't a joke. But his partner was very interested in uh, hearing what I had to say. Such is not the case with the Cheltenham Township Montgomery County Police Department. You know, it actually feels pretty good to rat out the Cheltenham police on my radio show because they deserve to be ratted out. And you're going to understand why after I say it, I'm about to say. I told the clerk at the front desk, I don't know if he was a police officer or whatnot, but he was 
acting as the clerk at the front desk of Cheltenham. I told him, hey, you, you've been had. The official story is a lie. The government staged it. You've been scammed into going along with a lie. And that clerk at the front desk said, we're going to go along with a lie. That's all I have to say to you. Have a nice day. Now, that was so incredibly hard to swallow. I I told a lot of people, went, told as many people as possible about that, wrote a couple articles on a Planet Infowars and David Icke's website for him to read out the Cheltenham Police Department to let him know, hey, they want to take people's guns. The people of Cheltenham need to watch out and got a little retribution when I called into the Alex Jones show on the fall equinox, same day as the Kenyan mall attack, and told uh, David Knight, who was covering for Alex that day, what happened. And David Knight's response to what the police officer or the clerk at the front desk said to me about we're going to go along with a lie, David Knight's response was, wow, that's amazing. I don't know if he could have said it any better. Boy, it was hard to swallow. But uh, they didn't get to take the guns because the American people fought back. <sighs> Thank goodness for that. And uh, I don't think any more shootings are going to fool anyone. Americans are finding out what, what the real deal is behind why they want to take the guns. Because they can take everything else after they do that. But moving on with the news, Obama approval hits all-time low. <laughs> yeah, Congress has a 6% approval rating. Uh here it says new polls show support for selfie shootout uh, POTUS as low as 38%. Obama's approval rating, 38%. It's only going to keep getting worse and worse and worse as uh, as time goes on. No question about that. Uh, people wake up, they'll kick him out of office, in which case it uh, can't get any worse if he gets kicked out of office. If you have a Obama support sticker on the back of your car, it might as well say, I am stupid. If you think, we'll give Obama time, he'll get his act together. If you give Obama time, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get the dawn of a new day. That's what you're going to get. Jordan Maxwell, not that long ago, made a huge discovery about a symbol, an inauspicious symbol. You've probably all seen this. It's a symbol Obama uses often about the sun coming up in the background. It's a red, white, and blue symbol, like, like an American symbol. That's the illusion. It has a sun coming up in the background, and there is, um, a, there's a field in the front where the sun is. That's dawn of a new day symbolism, as Jordan Maxwell has explained. It can be traced all the way back to the uh, uh, Soviet Union, had its earliest use there, which is inauspicious in and of itself. We don't want communism now, do we? If it becomes communist, the government can take everything, because it's so hard to run society without private property. Okay, but I'm digressing. The point is, the dawn of a new day symbolism, apparently it could be extraterrestrial in nature, because Jordan Maxwell uncovered a vast amount of evidence that that symbol, starting in Soviet, the Soviet Union, over time has been used to symbolize very inauspicious and very disturbing things. And now Obama is using that symbol. And as a matter of fact, so did uh, Mohammed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood. He actually used that dawn of a new day symbol. And uh, so if you give Obama time, you're going to get the dawn of a new day, which is probably going to be the uh, takeover of an alien species of uh, reptilians, wink, wink, and some greys on planet Earth. And we don't want that now, do we? Because this is our planet. We don't need uh, reptilians taking over and starting a dawn of a new day now, do we? But that's what you're going to get if Obama is given time. Hopefully his record low approval rating will wake some more people up. And, uh, oh, speaking of uh, the Soviet Union area, speaking of Russia, Russia warns America we will respond with nukes. That's in uh, red. Deputy Prime Minister says Moscow, quote, preparing a response, unquote, to U.S. plans for missile shield in Europe. We don't need another Cold War. That's just going to be too much if we have to worry about another nuclear attack. Now, Joel Skousen has been talking for, uh, for a long time about how nuclear war is one of the goals of the New World Order. And he's probably onto something with that. But this is uh, inauspicious enough that he put it in red. <laughs> the Soviet Union red, how appropriate. <laughs> But but anyhow, I'm no fan of Putin, but he's going a little too far if he actually thinks that it's okay to say we will respond with nukes. Uh, let's see what else we got here. A uh, cop who killed 13-year-old boy armed with plastic BB gun. The boy was armed with a plastic BB gun, and the cop who killed him is back on duty. <sighs> boy, I mean, what have to do to get fired? <laughs> well, suing the police is actually easier than you think. If you get it on film, it's quite easy. But getting a cop fired seems like that's virtually impossible. Cops are where the rubber beats the road. They need to get their act together, and among other things, they need to stop stealing money. As I explained on my first show, transportation laws only apply to commercial drivers, 
and commercial drivers are the only drivers who are required by law to have license registration, insurance, and license plates on their cars. And that means the cops, the judges, the politicians, the prosecutors, and the car insurance companies are guilty of theft on a multi-billion dollar scale with all the money that they've stolen from people through uh, through traffic tickets and everything. And uh, I sent a letter to my local police department telling them, hey, I know that you know that you're doing this, and I want you to stop, and I don't expect you to stop, because I know if you did, you'd you'd go bankrupt in a heartbeat, and so would all the other police departments. And I've actually been banned off of Facebook about 20 times in the past uh two months because I keep putting Eddie Craig's uh, Secrets Police Don't Want You to Know video on police department Facebook pages, and apparently they don't like that. Well, of course they wouldn't. Why would the cops want a video called Secrets Police Don't Want You to Know being put on their Facebook pages? So I keep posting that. I keep getting banned off Facebook. I have to keep making new accounts, and uh, I'm just going to keep doing that over and over. And I made it clear in my message, hey, uh, Facebook, you can ban me all you want. I'm just going to keep making uh new accounts so I can keep posting this on police department Facebook pages. And after I post it on every police department Facebook page on planet Earth, I'll probably do that all over again. Speaking of Eddie Craig, he actually had a family emergency that uh, on my first ever episode, that's the reason he didn't call in. But um, I'm not going to say any further about that. But he uh, plans to come on in the not too distant future. Um, he told me he did. Uh, he did tell me that. So uh, hopefully we'll see him soon. And um, I guess that covers all the news and everything. I got a couple of numbers here on my board. I don't know if Alora and Dr. Dream are calling on the uh, same number or not, but um, I'm going to try this one here. Um, 011-805-626, uh, you are on the air. Is this Laura or Dr. Dream? Hello? Yeah, hello. Is this Laura? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Laura, I can't hear you. Yes. You can. Yeah, I, I can. Why? Is that uh, surprising to you? Oh, the number you listed didn't sound like mine, but the 805 is, so maybe I, I heard you wrong. But, yeah, I'm here. Dr. Dream has a 928 yeah, okay. area. Yeah. Oh, wait. It's my Skype number. Never mind. Okay. You figured that out. Okay. Um, and is <laughs> the uh, 661 number, is that Dr. Dream? Dr. Dream, are you there? Laura? Yeah, I am here. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is you the 661 number his? No. I'm not sure because these are our Skype numbers, not our regular phones. Okay. So, But you're not with him at, right now, are you? No, we're at different lines. We're at uh, different computers. Okay. Uh, do you know if he's the 661 number? Yes, he is. I'm going to let him on right now. Dr. Dream, you are on the air. Welcome. How you doing? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Yep. Happy to see you, too. And uh, I don't actually remember you from Philly, as I said in the intro, but I know you were there. I remember Laura from Philly because I went to see her presentation and um, asked her a bunch of questions about things. And uh, I do remember you guys from the Return to Atlantis conference. That uh, beach collectivation on the new moon on the Quartz Crystal was something else. You... Uh, Know yourself, Dr. Dream. That was uh, quite a feeling. Thank you. That was an amazing experience, and I'm, I'm glad you got to be there uh, with us, and we remember you well. You were out there when we got out there to set up. You were out there already. Yeah, I uh, said, great, people have turned to Atlantis with, and then I said, hey, Laura, remember me? Uh, we met in Philly, and Laura recognized me. Unfortunately, I don't remember you from Philly. I uh, wish I could have been to all those events at the Free Your Mind conference in April, but uh that was not to be, but I will be seeing you again in Los Angeles. I did uh, make tickets for that uh, in 5D conference, and uh, if I got enough money, I'll uh, go to the one in Hawaii, which should be coming up. So uh, I hope you can go to that one as well. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, good things are happening. Yeah. By the way, you guys, I don't know if uh, you have volume control. Your voices are a little low. I can hear you, but they are kind of low. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to hear everything, so if you can't, make yourself any louder, just maybe raise your voice a little bit, have a little more water near you so we could be clear. I don't know if it's my line or yours, but um, I guess we might as well get started. I think the best thing to do maybe is alternate questions, starting with Laura, because ladies first, and then I'll go to uh, you, Dr. Dream, uh, and we'll just alternate uh, questions, So, because my goal is to get information out to people. And um, Laura, I think it only makes sense that we uh, start with um, – getting to know your 
the, the way I introduced you at the start of my show as a cosmic Gaia Sophia. I believe that's the phrase that Alfred Weber used, who's your colleague, of course, and uh, he referred to as a cosmic Gaia Sophia. Could you please elaborate to the audience what exactly that means? Well, this planetary body um, is not just uh, your typical planetary body. It's actually um, seated with a 13D monadic core, meaning that this is an ascension planet. And um, it became this way after the catastrophes on Lemuria and Atlantis. Um, and it was, in a sense, the Sophia energy morphing into the physical planet that has created this um, because the conditions in um, our cosmos ended up becoming very um, much a battle <laughs> with uh, different races. And so basically the Sophia energy, an extension of her is the divine feminine who um, is within all of us. And so the Gaia Sophia energy is also connected to the cosmic mother. It is the cosmic mother. It's the planetary body. It also connects to the divine trinity. And it's a part of our blueprint. So we are extensions of this energy, um, but many don't realize it. And so my path has always been about this um, as I've, you know, connected with the Venus transits and the path of the divine feminine and going into the labyrinth and the underworld um, to be a part of this global transformation and to empower the Ascension timeline that is a natural birthright um, being a child of Mother Earth. So... Um, I'm all about this work. I'm all about expressing everything that has to do with it, and it's such a difficult thing to articulate just in a few sentences, but I'll leave it at that. It has um, roots in our ancient history as far as how this developed to be what it is now, and this is the window period where we will really start to understand what I mean because it's a cosmic planet. It's a multidimensional planet. It's not just a 3D experience. Um, we have the ability to expand way, way, way beyond that, but we need to be a part of that activation. Yeah, that is true, and you're right about it uh, being a feminine planet. That's why they call it Mother Earth. People on Mars, um, well, I, I don't really know how much we – we'll get into Mars soon, uh, but people on uh, Mars would probably say Father Mars, if anything, because George Cavazos explained that that is a male energy uh, dominant planet. But um, switching gears, Dr. Dream, uh, I guess we might as well get into why you do what you do, um, what, what, what you do, uh, referring to the – stuff that we did at that Beach Collectivation at the uh, Return to Atlantis conference. Uh, why did you choose to do that? Well, excellent question. And um, my, my, my short answer on the fly would be because I don't know what else to do. But, um, no, there's so much more involved. That experience in, um, in Sarasota, I believe, was my – 184th Galactivation experience in 103 cities around the world in the last, at that point, I think it was 45 or 46 months. And so um, since the beginning of 2010, I've been uh, facilitating experiences very much like what you experienced, although I have to tell you now in 187 experiences, there's um, quite a bit of shifting of how the energies work. That was the very first one that um, we've done on, on a beach, let alone a uh, quartz, uh, mainly quartz uh, crystal sand beach. And so it was great. But my, my journey and my experience has uh, really early on given me the um, recognition of how we can impact energies around us and how important it is to raise the frequency, raise the vibration of, of what we're experiencing, of what we're feeling, and, and truly of who we are. And so um, in my journeys around the world and to sacred sites all over, I've had um, incredible opportunities to be exposed to and work with different tools and modalities um, and have the, the benefits from that. And so the Galactivation experience is considered a multi, multiple modality um, experience into a higher uh, frequency or vibration. And it's using um, 
essential oils, flower and gem essences. We had crystal bowls and gongs and chimes and Tibetan bowls and tuning forks and all sorts of other uh, and, and crystals and things like that. And, and all of these tools unto themselves are incredibly powerful. Um, and then what I get to do is kind of be like the, uh, the orchestra leader, um, if you will, and, and bring a really beautiful uh, resonance to um, how all of this is combined. And so you, you really got to experience one of the most unique activations we've ever done. I sure did. And the new moon and the quartz crystal made all the difference, I'm sure. But um, and it's the fact that Sarasota is where Earth's consciousness was seated. Now, that also is sure to make a difference. But um, getting <laughs> back to sure. Laura. Yes. Uh, Laura, we got to cover... Uh, your experience involving the planet Mars. And uh, before I get into that, when I mentioned Philly, one of the reasons I was so interested in seeing your presentation in Philly and uh, speaking to you was because um, someone I know works for the uh, Mars Society. It's not a job. It's, it's actually a hobby. And I've been trying to tell him that he's wasting his time because the Mars Society uh, acts as if the way the mainstream science and NASA uh, story of Mars is true. They They act as if that and they try to find ways to terraform Mars and uh, make it habitable. And Mars is nothing like what we think it's like. And um, I guess I'll get back get, uh, back to that later. But um, my um, the person I know that works in the Mars Society, he just refuses to believe that Mars is nothing like what we're told it's like, I guess, because it would have force him to change his paradigm. I've made you cited you as a source to explain it, but he still refuses to believe it. So um, I guess uh, we might as well... Uh, get into uh, your experience whistleblowing about bases on Mars and maybe get into the backstory involving that. Well, in 2006, um, I met somebody who I didn't realize was connected to all this at first. And uh, I thought I was just meeting this person in a normal way. But um, later on into the relationship, I discovered that he had been specifically sent to uh, pull me into this recruitment to go off planet in 2012 when I first met him, there was a lot of discussions about it, but I thought that this was just something in that person's plans. I didn't, I just thought I just met somebody who is doing this kind of work and I could go if, you know, because I've been invited, but I don't have to go. And that's what my initial thought was. And then I, it, then I found out it was a lot deeper than that. And they basically weren't really giving me much of a choice. And um, he was specifically sent um, cause I was targeted uh, to be lured into this project. Um, and so I started to research the names of the people that were connected to it because I had this a, a feeling that there was just massive manipulation and that, that, you know, there was mind control and technologies involved and all sorts of things. But I didn't have, like, a Project Camelot to go by. I didn't have other whistleblowers or anything like that. And so I just, you know, researched the people's names and, you know, wasn't really finding anything except for, you know, that they were a secret think tank that were dealing with UFO abductions and, um, and that's why they were contacting my uh, partner at the time. And so I just knew that there was more to it than that. And uh, and I kept digging and then finally discovered that these people are connected with artificial telepathy, my labs, psychotronic weaponry, mind control, and the type of things that don't sound very benevolent. You know, I mean, if we're working with extraterrestrials or with their technology, it certainly shouldn't include mind control and weaponry, invisible weaponry. And um, and I also had a lot of prophetic dreams about, you know, what this recruitment meant and what it would mean for me. And I was born with a really, really strong mission. So it was, it's, it's all about Mother Earth. It's all about Gaia. It's all about humanity, our unity, um, and ascension. Not in the fluffy sort of New Age type definition of it. <laughs> I can always get into that later. But, I mean, I was I was I I knew who – what I came here to do early on from the age of six onwards, maybe even younger. And so when this was presented to me, it was like the, the immediate was, response was no way. Um, but I didn't think that it was like black ops or something just so ingrained in the shadow government agendas, you know, having to do with the future and new world order and the plans for all of us, you know, one could easily just think it has to do with NASA or like a Richard Branson saying like, Oh, let's go to Mars. Let's go visit Mars. But it goes a lot deeper than that, and it, and it connects to these technologies like HARP and chemtrails, these agendas that are seeking to wipe out a huge portion of the population. And alternatives one, two, and three were set up in the Eisenhower administration um, via contact with extraterrestrials, um, and it had to do with uh, going, you know, into underground bases and off-planet colonies in the event of a catastrophe. 
But later, it's been discovered that that agenda was not to protect us. It was actually to control us and lead us to think that, you know, we are in some sort of catastrophic, you know, situation or timeline. But what I discovered was that this artificial time, or excuse me, the, the catastrophic timeline has been artificially induced through false flags, through technology, the creation of superstorms, weather modification, and all sorts of things. And so in 2006, I was figuring all this out, but I didn't have anything to go on but my intuition and what I knew from, you know, my childhood and what I was being prepared for and what I was, you know, somewhat exposed to being in the Eisenhower family, even though none of these secrets were found to me. There was nothing of talk about UFOs or ETs or agendas at all, but it was a big catalyst for me to start to ask questions about, hmm, what is he really saying when he talked about the military-industrial complex? So my whole life has been about putting these pieces together. And when I was up against this recruitment in 2006 and I was given not a choice, but I knew that I had a choice and it would take a lot of strength on my part to be able to follow through all the way, um, I made the choice to stay so that I could help humanity wake up to what's really going on so that we can be informed and make choices um, from a place of at least, you know, being in the know about, you know, what's, what's happening behind the curtain and, and behind the scenes. And that to me is a far more important path than protecting myself or my physical um, embodiment here in this human meat suit uh, to go off planet um, with, with, with elitists that could, could give a crap about the rest of humanity. That, that's not the path I'm here to go down, even though maybe that was uh, what the hope was for me, was to join in with their agenda. But this is what they do. They take well-intentioned people. They trick them into thinking that they're actually helping humanity. And people like Phil Schneider and others, you know, William Cooper, you know, woke up along the way and realized, you know, that that wasn't the case and ended up getting killed for speaking out. Um, but I, you know, have just been focusing on protection and knowing that they're probably not going to be able to, you know, really knock us over. And I felt, you know, I was in a position that it would be very difficult to off me or kill me. So I've just decided to just go for it and um, drop the fear of death and the fear of, you know, anything and just live you know, in integrity and truth and service to humanity and Mother Earth and Gaia. Sounds good. Sounds very good. I'm glad you uh, want to help uh, raise the vibrations and awareness of Earth. And uh, speaking of which, uh, Dr. Dream, I, I wanted to get into if you brought buy into some theory um, about uh, the significance of December 21st, 2012. Now, uh, two things um, – two uh, statements that people have made about what was significant on that day. First of all, Andromeda Council, Council contactee Tolek said that that was the day that the alignment between the Earth, the Sun, and the center of the Milky Way galaxy caused a vast amount of energy to uh, hit the, the core of the Earth, and that caused the core of the Earth to blossom, for lack of a better phrase, into fourth dimensional density, and that signaled the start of a new age of consciousness because over time, we are supposed to um, ascend into 4D, and some people say we'll go straight to 5D, and um, Tolik actually says it will occur in January 2014. Well, how about that? But I don't want people to obsess about that, because if you obsess about that, you're going to lose touch with reality, but he just said that. I might as well get that out. And another significance behind the date, December 21st, 2012, was that was the day According to, uh, I believe Jim Fel Self said this, Jim Self on um, his N5D radio interview and some whistleblower who did time travel technology um, with the government said that they found that the day December 21st, 2012 signified that nothing you do after that date will change the time and the outcome the outcome being ascension into a higher dimension of consciousness, the time will be the same in the outcome no matter what you choose to do. And I think Jim Self, when he said that date signifies when you are free, that's what he meant. You're free in the sense you can do whatever you want. It won't change the time of the vibrations. And if you believe Talek, it'll be in a few weeks. So what's your take on all that? Ah, um, I'm not familiar with the specifics of <clears throat> what you've said I'm, um, listen, I'm just here to experience it. I, I tend not to read um, a lot of what other people say are going to happen on certain dates and, and this and that. I'm, I'm very involved in, in my inner journey and my process because that's, that's what I control directly. Um, I can say, and Laura and I were talking about it on a radio show earlier today, that the energies in the last 12 months, and, and 12 months ago, 
we were at the Star Knowledge Conference um, preparing for the 12-12-12 the um, uh, ceremony, and then, of course, preparing for 1221. Um, the energies have been, I mean, incredible, amazing, outlandish, uh, challenging. I mean, you know, you name it. Um, but, you know, here now entering into the, you know, the, the tail end of 2013, um, I'm very optimistic about um, what's taking place, what has happened this year, and the the reflections that that I'm seeing and getting back from from the collective, from from what's what my filters allow in are very are very positive and very empowered and and lots of people coming to lots of people raising their consciousness and and expanding their awareness and so. Um, January 2014, I mean, whether something happens, it's, of course, something's going to happen. I mean, it's happening now and, and in each and every now. And so, um, you know, I like you say, just, just to get away from the obsessing and, and everything like that, it's the time now for all of us to do what we need to do. Most of that work is on the inside of ourselves, um, and and that's the real you know, place that um, that all this is going to continue to create the shift and come together. And I'm just, um, I'm thrilled to be here right now for this. And so am I. And the sooner it is, the better. But said it once, I'll say it again. Don't obsess about what Tullock said. He says his alien contacts told him that, but still, people obsess about that. They'll lose touch with reality, and we don't need people to lose touch with reality at this time when the uh, uh, Illuminati cabal is on the verge of uh, crashing down. But moving on to, to Laura again, uh, this is probably a question for your colleague, Alfred Weber, who I will have on my show next month, by the way. I'm not uh, exactly sure of the day. You may want to tune in for that. But um, he get onto the subject of humans and other life on Mars. I did see his presentation in Philly. And um, he was also uh, complaining, if you will, about Richard Hoagland in that interview I saw on his YouTube channel. He said, and I've talked about this too, I, I sent Richard Hoagland a request to come on my show, but I don't know if he's going to want to come on after he hears me say this. I've already said it anyway, but Richard Hoagland, love him, hate him, bless him for exposing that there had to have been life on Mars in the past because of Cydonia. The mathematics is, is, is just too perfect, too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. Those had to be made by intelligent design. And um, his work with uh, 19.5 latitude on the Earth, torsion field physics, that is uh, significant enough that people need to take into consideration 19.5 degrees is a significant uh, spot on the earth because that's where the uh the tetrahedron i believe it is connects with the uh the sphere of the earth but but anyway reason it's love him hating with richard he just uh refuses to acknowledge um anything and even even demonizes people who say that there is life on mars and a, a nasa program on mars and um alfred weber didn't get into why he does that but i think richard has made it clear he doesn't think people can handle the truth but for him to demonize the fact, I mean, the in-your-face obvious fact is Alfred Weber has shown that there are human bases on Mars, ET bases on Mars, and even life on Mars, not to mention the sky on Mars is actually a baby blue color as the Project Camelot people expose and it more closely resembles the desert of Arizona. I mean, um, not to pick on Richard Hoagland or anything, but can you maybe uh, give your take on why he demonizes people who say there's a current program on Mars and also – Fill us in on what you know about current humans and li other life on Mars. Well, I mean, there was, there was, there used to be life on Mars. There used to be life on Venus. You know, we we come from many different star systems. There's life everywhere. We're a multidimensional species, for God's sake. So, I mean, can't put a lid on a volcano, and it looks like that's what Richard Hoagland's trying to do is cover up something that's that you can't really cover up at the end of the day. Um, the force of truth and what's really happening is so much greater because. You know, we're dealing with 7 billion people, and people are, you know, seeing these stories. People are having their own experiences, and more and more is coming out. For example, Michael Reif, who wrote the Mars records with his wife using a biofeedback system so that he could recall his memories, he worked on Mars for 20 years and then was age-reversed. And, you know, he's working with his wife, and he's disclosing technologies that people, you know, do not – even can't even fathom i mean only some movies out there even show those kind of technologies and so you know when it comes to agendas like this we're dealing with compartmentalism we're dealing with a lot of control um but people can't see the bigger picture so they sometimes think that they're doing the right thing when they make statements 
So, you know, we've got ringleaders that are behind that, and then we've got agents that, you know, attest to it. And then we've got, you know, the people that um, they use as they become their handlers um, to keep up a certain facade. And then everybody that ends up being exposed to it is manipulated into thinking that something is true or not true. And so people are being used right and left. A lot of people, you know, sound sincere and, and are actually saying things that aren't true, but they believe it's true what they're sharing. So I think Richard, I think he's a sincere person. I have to say I really admire his wife. So I've got to think that the man has some integrity and desire for truth and doing the right thing. But I think that the information he gets from whoever he's around are insisting that these are the facts um, and closing, you know, and, and he's closed off from the rest of it. You, I mean, you kind of have to go through something like Project Pegasus or be recruited to Mars or be a Michael Reif or be a, you know, a whistleblower or somebody who's right in the center of it to be able to speak on these subjects. Otherwise, it's a, it's a very strong chance you're going to be in a different room with a different group of people that are all about, you know, hiding this knowledge and making sure that everybody who works for them is – believing it so that they go out and spread that disinformation. A lot of people that spread disinformation don't even know they're doing it. Some do. I'm not here to, you know, decide that about Richard Hoagland. I, I you know, just support the best in everybody. Um, so I give him the benefit of the doubt on that level that, you know, maybe, you know, he, he, he's sincere about what he thinks is true, but I can absolutely assure people that he's covering up something huge that needs to be looked at. I mean, there used to be the planet Maldek with life on it that exploded and became part of our asteroid belt. So to even, you know, be stuck on whether there's life on Mars when it's like, let's move on from that and look at the real bigger picture. There, there used to be life on Venus. There's, you know, bases on Saturn. There's bases on the moon. It's like, let's get through, you know, UFO 101 and accept the fact that there is life everywhere and start to understand why there's been secrecy, because it's not about disclosure and about finally revealing, yes, there's ETs and UFOs. I mean, it's obvious. Millions of people have been abducted. There's plenty of stories out there. Um, it's about understanding why the secrecy. What are the agendas? Why has this been kept from us? Let's get over the hump and start to give humans more credit for the stories that they tell and stop making them look like delusional, crazy people and, and not empower the authorities and really look to each other because that's where the truth is going to come out. The rest of these players, you know, we're going to be dealing with the duality of some, you know, know the truth, others don't, but, you know, people are threatened. People can't really disclose all of it. So um, we're not going to get the real stuff there, except for the ones that are the whistleblowers that are really, you know, who have lived through it, who have survived it and come out the other side. And Richard's not one of those people. He's a researcher, um, and I think he's, he's really put a lot of good stuff out there, but, but he's blocking the rest, and, um, and whether he, he, you know, knows it or not, that's, that's, that's another question. I just don't know him personally, but, you know, I know you can tell a lot about a man by the woman he's with, and I have to say, like I said, I, I really appreciate her, and she appreciates me, so, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, something will shift him, because we need that. We need those with a good heart and good intentions to open their eyes, um, because there's very few that are actually out to get us, uh, but they've just got the, everybody else tricked and fooled and duped, and, 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 and people are buying it. Yeah, that is the case, and um, I don't really think we need to get into what life is on Mars. If anybody wants to uh, see that, just check out Alfred Lavermont Weber's YouTube channel. Uh, just type in um, Mars cover-up or something in the search, and um, saw the uh, some presentation material he showed there about what kind of life there is on Mars, like scorpion creatures with a human head, among other things. But um, moving on, uh, Dr. Dream, me recommended meditations. Now, there's many different meditation styles, and uh, one meditation style, whenever I meditate, that I always, always, without exception, follow, and I got this from George Kavaslis, who I deeply admire, so I reference him a lot, but um, Kavaslis says, whenever you meditate, don't let energy come into you. Always radiate energy with your heart, soul, essence. He's um, explained, if you let energy come into you, you will let um, negative entities come into you. And even if you ask your guardian angels and spirit guides to help you, if you willfully let the energy come into you, um, they will um, have the chance to affect you in negative ways. I mean, this is different from healings and whatnot, where you might let unconditional love of light come into you. But uh, meditation specifically, I always say radio with your heart. And meditations where you have to put headphones in your ears. I very rarely meditate without that. But do you have any advice for people who – uh, say, what kind of meditations do you recommend for not just the uh, novice, uh, intermediate, and the expert? Well, um, I think that <clears throat> there's, there's 
uh, what what is that comment? You know, uh, many many streams lead um, to the same river, leading to the same ocean, leading to the same oneness, body of water, and so. Um, I just recommend for people to find what's really drawing them in. Um, I'm not a big fan of, here, this is the way you should do it, and if you're not doing it this way, you're not getting the most out of it. You're not, you know, all that stuff. It's just like, hey, listen, we're all different. There's over 7 billion of us here. Let's, that, you know, when I do breathing exercises with people, I say, listen, you know how to breathe. Just find the rhythm of your breath and now visualize this. It's I want to tell people what to do. Um, you know, we all need to, at this point, be empowering each other to follow our own intuition and, and just to connect with, with what feels the best. Now, that being said, I highly recommend people look into, um, this isn't a meditation, but it's some music that um, uh, we're, we're, we're really loving these days, and it's by Mark Romero, R-O-M-E-R-O. And uh, it's MarkRomeroMusic.com. But um, uh, Mark's been on our radio show. A NASA researcher um, found that his music literally harmonizes and balances the environment that it's been being played in. Um, we're going to be doing some um, events coming up in 2014 with, with Mark and his wife, um, and we're really excited about all this. And, and one of the big things that, that Mark has um, been working with is if, if um, one of his services now that he offers is you take a picture of your smart meter and you send it to him, you email it or, or whatever, um, he will energize and change the energy coming off the smart meter. And um, he's done this with, um, with my cell phone. And he's done this with a, a friend of ours with her um, her smart meter. And um, it's just amazing because they went out before he did it, and he lives states away, so, you know, like 2,000 miles away from these folks. They went out. They muscle tested. They went weak right around their smart meter. They sent him the picture. He energized it, told him, you know, that he was done. They went back out there. They were strong at the smart meter. They went to the neighbor's smart meter that hadn't been done. Again, they went weak right away. They sent a picture of that smart meter to him. He did the same thing to it, and um, they go. They now go strong around the smart meters. So we're now looking at a, a three-event series, um, probably on the West Coast, um, where uh, part of the conference will be uh, Mark literally training people on how to do this with energy. I mean, this is really – the like the next frontier stuff is is how do we offset the EMFs? How do we offset the smart meters? How do we offset what is literally offsetting us? And so um, there's going to be some some major developments in this. And what I love about it is it's not about buying a product. Yeah, you know, Mark trains you on how to do this, but then there should be legions of people training other people out there. Um, it empowers the individual. It reminds us that we make a difference, the energy that we carry and that we can harness and that we can work with over, over you know, it just trumps everything. And so um, it's just really important for us to, to tap into this. And meditation is a great way to, you know, get into that into that zone because that's really what has to happen, getting away from just all the distraction that's all around us and, and tapping in. We went, we went camping recently. You know, we've been on the road so much and conferences and the, the kids are in school, but we went camping right after Thanksgiving. Unbelievable how good it felt to be. We weren't completely off the grid, but pretty close. Certainly for us, it would be considered that. And just how good it felt to be out in nature and just not being surrounded by wiring and home and, and you know, all the stuff that we deal with in our, in our communities and everything. So I highly recommend people find what feels best to them. And once they get good at that, what's the next step up? to reach for that's going to feel even better. And when I say feel better, I'm not talking about, you know, just um, surface experiences. I'm talking about that deep feeling of feeding our souls, feeding our spirits, feeding the collective, feeding the multiverse. Um, and that's what's most exciting to me about meditation.
Right. I like to uh, meditate, too, as I said. By the way, just so I take a moment here, uh, we'll be taking calls uh, probably in the last uh, 35, 40 minutes. I usually like to try to give 45 minutes, but since I got two guests on now, I'd like to take a little bit extra time getting out information before I take calls. May have to cut back a couple minutes on each caller because of that. But if anybody wants to call in, the call-in number is 646 Four seven eight four seven four seven. I'm sure you actually can see it on the screen in front of you if you're on the computer, but just want to get that out. We'll be taking calls um, in about um, 40, uh, 40 minutes or so. So uh, moving on, Laura, I heard you mention in your um, presentations that you do subscribe to the uh, theory. Well, that's, actually, it's not a theory, and I'm going to get into how I know it's not, that uh, humans were created as a uh, slave species. Uh, how do we know that that's a fact? Well, Andrew Bartzis, a Kashik Records reader, I have a lot of respect for the guy. I make reference to him a lot, and rightfully so. His Akashic Records skills are one of the best sources ever. So unless negative entities are toying around with his mind, then it only makes sense to use him as a source. And in a 20-part series that he did on the Creating 5D YouTube channel that I recommend everybody watch, uh, watch it twice. It's that good, that informative. Uh, near the beginning of the show, he talked about how Zachariah Sitchin's first three books were very accurate. Uh, yeah, there is an Ibiru. Yeah, the Anunnaki come from it. And the Anunnaki genetically engineered humans by create, combining their DNA with Homo erectus DNA. Although Bartis did say that uh, Sitchin was wrong about the reason they wanted the gold. It was actually so they could ingest it to uh, get more male consciousness energy because gold represents the sun. It was not to shield the atmosphere of their planet in the Biru. And he also said Sitchin was off by a uh, few tens of thousands of years. It was not 450,000 years ago as uh, Sitchin estimated. By the way, if anybody's wondering how life could possibly exist on the Biru when it's that far from the sun, the answer is quite simple. Every planet has its own consciousness filtering system, which allows for life to exist on it no matter where in space it's located. Uh, but that's a, another story in of itself. However, I wanted to get, uh, get into your beliefs on this, Laura, because um, as I explained when I had Dr. Friedman on, uh, excuse me, I why I call him Dr. Uh, Stanton Friedman, he's not a doctor, but uh, uh, we talked about this because Sitchin was his colleague about um, how the possibility that Illuminati forces hijacked uh, Zachariah Sitchin after his third book um, because uh, George Kavasa told me that they tried to spin that whole story of hum humans being created as a slave species and um, – in a way that would demonize humanity and make us think less of ourselves and um, other evidence that Sitchin was hijacked by Illuminati forces. Watch David Icke's documentary, Revelations of a Mother Goddess, and you might think that maybe there is some truth to the idea that reptilian forces hijack Sitchin. But um, regardless of whether or not that's true, um, can you elaborate on why, um, aside from what I just said about what Andrew Bartz says about Sitchin being right, why you subscribe to the uh, humans created as a slave species theory and also maybe give your take on why Sitchin may have been wrong after his third book. Okay. Well, I, I, I've done a lot of soul searching. I, all, I, I, I process constantly. I'm, I'm, I, I call spacing out my office, and I'm just connecting dots and just traveling back into time through my heart portal. And um, so certain research I read, you know, lines up with what I feel my intuition has already resonated with or what my memories um, have shown me. Um, you know, just through a lot of work, you know, my whole life, you know, in, in, in these sort of subjects. And, um, you know, basically, by the time the Anunnaki came around, we weren't dealing with the first seedings of Adam and Eve. This was a later, like maybe the third seeding. Um, and, you know, the first seeding of Adam and Eve were in Lemurian times. And basically, when there were cataclysms, the vibration of the planet, you know, the density got lower. Uh, we ended up falling in vibration from four, five, six dimensional energy to uh, one, two, three, dimensions one, two, and three. And so it threw us into a vibration of survival, of having to work harder for everything. And um, around this time, the idea of, you know, the trinity of, of God source had ended up becoming plural where there were pantheons and then there were the watchers and, you know, the archons and all this sort of stuff because these Beings and deities, you know, ended up leaving, you know, the Pleroma and Godhead because the Godhead had ended up dividing so much, and the opposition from the separation producing the Luciferian energy ended up getting caught in the mix, which led to the Gaia Orion Wars and the Syrian Orion Wars, and everything about Maldek exploding and the life on Mars and Venus being wiped off, and then the eventual sinking of Lemuria and Atlantis. So 
when we got into this lower density, you know, humans were mutated. Our DNA uh, was, was completely affected. We weren't these higher dimensional beings that were able to come and go from the physical as we, we used to be able to. And so the Anunnaki came and actually upgraded our DNA, but they upgraded something that wasn't originally mutated. I mean, basically many beings were able to leave and go back out into space through, you know, portals, but the ones that remained are the ones that ended up being mutated. And, and then the beings from Mars and Maldek ended up incarnating into um, Atlantis and lowering the vibration because they introduced patriarchal agendas and the dark occult technologies and just the massive manipulation of, you know, our, our energetic bodies through ethereal implants to basically set the stage for creating an artificial timeline that's playing out as we speak with this new world order agenda. And so the dumbing down of the human species was to be able to use us and siphon our energy to be able to um, power these technologies so that our free energy would be used as a weapon against us. And basically the reason these lower creator beings did this was because the density of everything had, had gotten lower, and instead of being on a path of redemption or taking the divinity path, which is what the sacred union path represents on this ascension planet that became an ascension planet in response to this, because Sophia morphed into the physical planet, um, it ended up taking a different route. And that's where the tree of knowledge comes in and, and, and the polarity or the duality of good and evil. Um, basically evil ended up getting out of control and too many humans ended up becoming a part of this agenda to the point of total takeover. And even um, the name Yahweh, uh, the imposter Lucifer ended up using that name, which distorted all religions. And so basically the agenda to dumb down humanity is so there can be this agenda of domination and control and so that these lower creator beings can play God instead of us connecting with true source. And they actually changed their DNA to be able to do this, so that no higher being could incarnate into their lines to heal and redeem them. And um, ba basically there was a rebellion when there was uh, healing attempts, hybridization healing attempts, where the reptilian energy and the orifin, which are a grail line, um, were mixed together. They ended up turning them into the 13 families, but to keep that going, they have to torture them, mind control them through trauma. Because if they didn't have the trauma, they would be connecting to their higher genetics. But to keep them locked into the reptilian possession, they get abused. It's multi-generational abuse. And that's so that they can utilize false flags and all these different, you know, technologies to keep humanity dumbed down when it takes a lot of effort to keep us dumbed down because just because our DNA went dormant or because we had tinkering, you know, with our DNA to upgrade us a little bit just so that we could be functional slaves instead of Neanderthals, um, we have a, an, an incredible ability to just bounce back. That's what the divinity paths are about, and that's why Gaia, Sophia, you know, came into the picture to assist us in this. But the rebellion has to do with the absolute um, attack on the divine feminine, the attack on nature, and um, the – continuation of these agendas where time travel and teleportation is utilized to falsify documents, to change our history, to create religions and belief systems that keep us dumbed down. So it's not really our DNA that's the problem. It's our blocked consciousness from our higher self that's the problem, which directly affects our DNA, which directly affects the stargates on the planet. So what they're attempting to do is put this planet on an artificial life support where we're sort of like zombie-like. We don't really have feelings. We're not connected to our soul. And we are serving the elite. And those who buy into it become sort of the upper class and they get some of the benefits. But the ones that are the resistance, you know, are targeted like we see today, you know, the, 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 the beginnings of this in a more overt way. It's been hap happening covertly for a really long time. So we're not really dumbed down. We have incredible potential. We're actually way superior. And they're threatened by us. And they're threatened by us, and, and the reason they target the divine feminine is because that's the missing link. It represents the dark matter. It represents the junk DNA and our ability to um, connect to this other aspect of ourself, which then awakens the divine masculine and kicks out these lower polarities of Mars and Saturn, which have kept us locked into the negative ego, which has immersed us in these patriarchal agendas, which we don't even realize because we're rewarded for this behavior. You know, people make a lot of money when they serve these agendas. Men are, you know... Um, rewarded for being the player and women are objectified but you know given ego boost for being the seductress and it's just a huge joke and it's a huge theatrical performance to keep us completely distracted and completely in our lower base senses and in our lower chakras but we can snap out of that instantly we are not dumbed down we've but just been manipulated and it's to serve them because they're a parasite parasites feed on people you know people that are connected to their divinity direct 
um, directly connect with source. That's, that's what keeps them in the flow of regeneration, connected with nature, connected to the central star within this earth. But parasites are cut off from source, and they plug right into um, the soul essence, the creativity, the prana, and the kundalini of humans, and also the prana and the chi of Mother Earth to control her through harp and the chemtrail agenda. And it's simply us waking up and understanding the game that's going to help us call our energy back. And it's going to increase our immune system and the planetary body's immune system, which will allow us to get over the hump and not be on this artificial life support, but actually heal holistically as a global family that's working the energy um, on, a, on, a, on a deep level rather than, you know, the, the appeasements of self-gratification that technologies give us, which doesn't even care about morality. It helps us to be advanced humans without the spiritual component, which will lead to our destruction just like what happened in Atlantis. But they have a plan for that, and that's what time travel is all about. And that's their life support system is that they stay alive via technology, but we can transcend this, this via our consciousness. Um, but for them to, you know, be able to do this via technology, they need us to feed on. As soon as they lose us, those technologies mean nothing. Right. I'm going to get into the timeline stuff in a little bit, but i got to give Dr. Dream a chance. And uh, another thing that Andrew Bartz has said – he uh, said something that, um, depending on how you look at it, might make the uh, conspiracy theorists and truth movement look bad because he said something that completely goes against what many people believe, that the power elites, the Illuminati, they actually want our pineal glands open. He said that they don't want your pineal gland closed because if your pineal gland is closed, then they cannot brainwash you as easily with their subliminal programming and such – and he said that the fluoride, the whole thing about fluoride um, in water suppressing your pineal gland, that ain't right. The fluoride's main purpose, out of the many poisonous things it does to your body, the main thing that they want to use the fluoride for is to weaken some defense part of your body so they can implant metaphysical microchips, for lack of a better phrase, from other uh, dimensions, uh, I guess is the right word. These microchips, they can implant in your body to control you if they... Uh, uh, can poison your body with fluoride, and I believe he said that um, there are certain uh, people that they try to do this uh, to more so than others, implant these microchips, and I guess fluoride isn't the only way they do it, but um, I guess what's your take on that, and um, do you agree um, that, yes, they do want our pineal glands open so they can brainwash us, so we might as well ditch the whole thing about fluoride um, suppressing the pineal gland, because that's not what they want to do to us. I don't know. Um, it's not my uh, particular area of emphasis. It doesn't make sense, though, from what I from from the little bit that I do know about the pineal gland, that they would want our pineal glands to be wide open because that's not um, to me, from what I understand, it doesn't seem to set up an environment of being able to be controlled and manipulated. But who knows? I mean, I don't know how. They're all playing that game, and 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 what it, you know how it how it's all um, really coming down. I think you know we need to get away from fluoride. It just it makes sense. I mean, there's no there's nothing about fluoride that makes any sense to me that I should be putting it into my body or on my body or anything like that. So, you know, it's just there's. This is this is the this is why I carry a pendulum in my pocket. There's so much. As quickly as you can find one person to say one thing, you can find another person to say exactly the opposite. And I think we have to start trusting our intuition and and our body truth barometers to to kind of assist us in weaving our way through this. And some things it just doesn't matter to me, like the whole fluoride thing. Listen, I don't want fluoride in or around my body at all. So whatever reasons they're doing it for and however that plays into this and the other, it doesn't really matter to me because I've already made my decision about fluoride, and that is I'm not having anything to do with it. So, you know, I think those are the areas where it's great to have the information. But once I get the information, it's like, oh, okay, fluoride, yep out of my field and and that's kind of the end of it and, and and I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on stuff I do revisit things as different information presents itself um, but I'm just really big on us being empowered and identifying these things for ourselves and and really feeling 
our way into it. That's what's um, kept me out of most of the, the trouble that's been available to me in my life. Okay. Um, so I guess we really can't settle on an agreement there. But um, regardless, um, Laura, actually, before I get into this uh, timeline thing, I just want to point out a couple things just for the sake of the listeners. Uh, we talked about the Anunnaki a couple minutes ago. Uh, it's worth pointing out the term Anunnaki actually refers to a hodgepodge of uh, – uh, different races of um, of aliens that are the children of Anu, the universal geneticists, and the Anunnaki from Nibiru are actually just uh, one faction within the greater Anunnaki whole, and the Nibiru Anunnaki, uh, George Kavaslis calls them the false Anunnaki because of their malevolent nature. They don't take good intentions for humanity, and they're actually just one of several different races on Nibiru. Um, there are other races of uh, species on Nibiru, which, according to Andrew Bartzis, is uh, Nibiru's uh, directly correlated its appearance with uh, the amount of fear that humanity has. And um, Andromeda Council contact Italic said that the uh, uh, higher conscious entities who watch over us did uh, go through a lot of trouble to put Nibiru in an orbit above planet Earth so it doesn't um, doesn't affect us in a negative way, and it's currently orbiting above there. Uh, so um, that's good to know that if that's true, that we have um, people watching over us to make sure uh, other astronomical bodies that have Direct with our with our fear energy aren't going to to harm us, but um yeah the moon feminine energy you mentioned that's what the uh the moon is the ball and chain around the uh, Earth's feminine energy it uh the moon's supposed to be feminine energy but since it's been captured by malevolent reptilian forces they're trying to use it to suppress Earth's feminine energy and um that's one of its main jobs but uh moving on uh you mentioned timelines they do a lot of time travel work I did see the conspiracy theory with Jesse Ventura episode on time travel. That's a good primer for anyone who wants to look into that subject. And there's other sources that go into greater detail about that. But um, using what you know about timelines, um, how exactly does the government go back in time? Forward in time, it's easy. They see the future. They see what will happen. They manipulate that in the way that they want so they can control it. But going back in time to do something is something I'm a little confused about. Because uh, Andrew Bartzis once said that they went back in time recently to prevent whistleblowers from coming out. Let's use that as an example. If they want to go back in time to prevent whistleblowers from coming out, how would they do that? And how will going back in time and doing that affect us in this timeline? Won't it cause another timeline when they do whatever they try to do to prevent the whistleblowers from coming out? Well, I mean, it's very tricky. One has to almost look at everything like the organism of the human body and the way that memories work, the way that our um, our, our own healing works, the way that we, you know, resolve the past. And, I mean, we're all connected, even these malevolent forces. And, yes, you know, the Nibiru basically um, is, a, is a chunk of Maldek when it exploded, and it's Luciferian. It's the Luciferian faction of the Anunnaki. Not all Anunnaki are bad. Um, actually, the Lumerians use time travel technology to protect their races um, because we've been in a huge scramble for the last 26,000 years where when the planetary body uh, got thrown out of whack, um, this is the period where it's now in alignment with the galactic. The, 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 the period between point A and point B has been a very gray area. You know, there, there's, it's been very hard for beings to connect with source. It's been very easy for us to be manipulated. Um, and there's been an entanglement, you know, because of these uh, negative alien agendas and the treaties, you know, originating with Crowley. Um, and, um, you know, the effects that that has had because of the, the hidden use of these technologies. And so, Time travel and teleportation has been a means for um, manipulating history, for going back and, you know, removing certain people and just, you know, kind of tinkering with all of it. And so I've always been, you know, pretty aware of this since I was a kid. And I mastered the ability. Actually, I, I didn't really master it. It was really out of control. I've been actually mastering it now by being able to actually be in my body. But I was never in my body at all. I mean, I was gone and I was doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but I made sure that the, the things that kept my physical body alive were my kundalini or I would channel certain energies um, that were similar enough to me to be able to keep my physical body going. And this was all validated when I went to a psychic institute. So I'm not just, you know, saying this because it sounds cool or it sounds like that m must be what it was. I wrote a book about it, actually. And so I experienced the form of time travel on a natural level by tracing some of these things on a multidimensional level um, and facing some of the gatekeepers and some of the, 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 the technological manipulations that take place because I was a target. You know, basically Project uh, Pegasus, Andrew Pichago said they had my name in 1972, which is a year before I was born, and they were able to access me through quantum access technologies called looking glass technologies, and they went back into the past. 
And so my countermeasure being really, really sensitive, I was a very empathic, very sensitive kid, was I knew that, like, I was being tracked um, pretty early on. And so I went back and, and started to understand the nature of the divine feminine and her exile and, you know, the artificial timeline and what they had set me up to do, which wasn't true to what my mission is. And so we have to stay two, have to, two steps ahead of things, which is the way I work with, you know, timelines and stargates, because they've been attempting to shut it down. Um, and our job is to keep it open by understanding what we're made of because we're directly linked to it. And so their ability to go back into time has, in a sense, to do with accessing, you know, certain portals, similar to us being able to access these portals within ourselves when we go back into our own past lives and we're able to resolve things or heal things that affect the person we are today. Just because they're able to go back or send people back doesn't mean that they're able to achieve their goals because, you know, we are dealing with free will and we're dealing with more their ability to falsify documents than their ability to mess with um, a soul. Unless that soul is so weak and, and has been so traumatized that they're easily possessed and they're easily led astray. So it takes very strong individuals to be able to run into beings from the future or from the past that are trying to tinker with things. Um, the biggest thing that they do is, is, is screw up information and documentation. Um, actually, I found out through Andrew Bartis that the whole Eisenhower death camp rumor was a falsified document that they um, created via time travel to make him look like the bad guy, to make him look like he did this huge genocide, and he said that none of it's true. And I was, you know, saying to people that were sharing that information with me that I knew that it was time travel manipulation. And I would say that whether I was an Eisenhower or not, and if he had, you know, been involved with death camps, I would be the family member that would say it and be a whistleblower. But it just so happens that that's one example of how they tinker with stuff. Uh, what kind of technologies do they use? Well, you know, I, I'm not – the person like Andrew Vishaga that's actually gone through it. I mean, he, you know, was time traveled back to Gettysburg and this and that. But what we have to understand is it's gray to alien technology. And a lot of what the gray aliens are able to do is imitate and simulate realities that aren't organic, that look real. And so what they've been attempting to do is to create a whole nother matrix. That's an imitation of the original creation and set it up with a story, um, and, 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 you know, religion to back it up and, and government, you know, history books and, and, and the school systems to, to all support this so that we're dealing with, like, you know, a simulated reality that our kids are raised in that they think is truth when they look in the history books when the actual real history, you know, is based on, you know, Akashic Records, based on our soul journey, and based on the fact that we are multidimensional. There's many timelines, many dimensions, and many truths out there. It's not all going to be one thing. But the one that they're trying to solidify into our consciousness to get us to believe it is a false one. The one that we're learning about in school, the ones that our governments are shoving down our face, none of those are real. Um, those are, you know, uh, given to us through the manipulation of time travel and teleportation. The real truth is within our soul because we've all been on unique journeys. That's where we're going to access our memories, and that's where we are able to counteract the effects of these timeline jumpers. We dealt with timeline jumpers in Atlantis, the, the conference in Atlanta, the return of Atlantis, trying to sabotage what we are doing with the Stargates and with you know, the powerful activation that was going on there. So how do we counteract it? We have to be super sensitive. We do not want to dumb down our sensitive psychic bodies. Um, because it hurts too much or we're too uncomfortable. We just need protection. But we can, you know, you can tell when something's, you know, tinkering, you know, because they're not dealing with the same laws of the physical body that we're dealing with. You know, we're dealing with, you know, artificial time. We're dealing with, you know, a certain level of amnesia. But when you're dealing with um, these technologies and you're not functioning in this 3D reality and you're in the upper fourth dimension or fifth dimension, um, you know, you have the ability to tinker with the time loop, which is a spinning circle, where one can jump into the future and into the past and into the now. That's what we do as incarnating souls. Some of us come from the future. Some of us come from the past. Um, it depends, you know, where we are and where we're contracted to work energy because we're all time travelers. We're all teleporting when we die and are reborn. The difference is, is that some souls are strong enough to have some level of say in where they're placed, whereas some don't when they're dealing with dark ritual manipulation when they're dealing with monarch slave programming which captures souls and brings them into agendas or when one's dealing with multi-generational abuse because they're born into an illuminati family that's when that soul does not have that sovereignty like some of us do when we claim it and we re we, we we call it back to ourselves um and that's you know the danger right now is because th that 
that group is is behind you know all these agendas but most of them if they had their strengths and and you know weren't targeted as children and as babies and yanked from other dimensions would be standing up against it like Aaron Green Hicks and Aaron McCollum and others have you know there needs to be more of them those are really brave incredibly strong souls that have been able to overcome a, a, a enough of it to be able to tell us what's happening but we have to understand that teleportation and time travel is an imitation of natural abilities that we have to do that when we work energy and understand the wholeness of creation and the fact that future, past, and now is all interlinked. Just because they have technologies to tinker with all of it doesn't make it real as far as what they're doing to our soul. What makes it real is the simulation and artificial replication, which isn't a true reality, but it's a real issue that we're dealing with that we're up against, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, I'll have, when I uh, have Alfred Weber on, I'll ask him about time travel because maybe he could explain the science behind how they how they do. Because uh, you said it's kind of tricky to explain. Uh, and uh, Vishago, I'd like to have him on. He said he's got a shoulder injury uh, that he's coping with, but he said he'll get get back to me when he heals up uh, to come. My show, we'll talk about it no doubt then. Because as Alfred Weber said, it's the deepest, darkest state secret. Time travel is probably more than ETs. As a matter of fact, uh, Area Fifty One. Uh, may very well deal with more time travel stuff than they do with extraterrestrial stuff. Uh, Andrew Bartos talks about how there's a lot of time travel stuff going on at Area 51 and not just ET stuff, but that's uh, but that's another subject it's, in of itself. Uh, right, real quick, though. You want to say something more? Real quick. Oh, I was just going to add something real yeah, quick. Yeah, go ahead. The looking glass tech... The looking glass technologies are able to look into the past. They're not able to see anything beyond 2012. Only chronovision can, but it depends on the person using it is going to shift and alter what they're going to see because not everybody sees the same things. They're really not able to look into the future anymore because the 2012 period has wiped out the ability for timelines to be fixed. It's only us and the imprints that we carry that create the timelines now. So we either annihilate ourselves or we free ourselves. And basically, you know, yeah, this is where the free sure. reign is. Yeah, Andrew Barsha said there's three timelines now, the main organic one and an upper and lower. Although George Kavaslo said that there are more than three. It's just that you can group uh, the upper and lower into a lot of timelines into one. Maybe I'll get into that at some other point. But um, uh, Dr. Dream, I wanted to get into the subject of asking angels as a guide. And I'm going to guess that you um, ask angels and guides with your work. I'm assuming you do. Um, I've heard uh, you don't want to ask your guard angels and spirit guides for too much help because if you ask for too much help it might uh come back to haunt you in some way i personally um rarely ever ask them for help i follow a philosophy of try to do it on your own without asking them even though they're there for you you might want to try to suck it up and do it yourself that's my mentality but um <laughs> do, you, do you know anything about when asking them is too much too much asking your angels and guides for help well i mean you've got to know already just from this um this interview that um my perspective would be along the lines that if you're asking your angels and guides too much, then you're not feeling very empowered within yourself. And so that, to me, would be a red flag. If you're constantly looking outside of yourself, um, then, then there's an issue there. And that issue is you're not relying on yourself enough. You're not in enough gratitude and appreciation of the skills, gifts, and talents um, that that one possesses, and so um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that that that's a big piece of it. Yeah, sounds right. Um, oh, we have a caller in. I'll uh, get to that caller after I ask Laura one final uh, one final question here. I had something written down my paper here. Um, first of all, Laura, before I get into this extraterrestrial subject, I just quickly want to point out. I remember. Uh, we had a conversation um, at the Return to Atlantis conference about um, the, what the Arians are. Uh, David Icke talks in his books about how the reptilians, at the top of the Illuminati ladder of authority, there's reptilians interbred with a blonde-haired, blue-eyed species of Nordics, um, which he refers to as Arians, which he said settled on Mars. And uh, Credo Motwa, the Zulan sh shaman, says that um, the, uh, those Nordics, he refers to them as the Mazungu. And um, I thought perhaps from Patricia Corey's work, that the Aryans are the Anunnaki from Nibiru, but I thought maybe they're actually a malevolent um, type of Pleiadian, because not all Pleiadians are benevolent. There are some malevolent ones, and maybe they were the ones but that were the Aryans. And you said you weren't an expert on this, but you said it was an interesting thing you'd like to look into it. Well, 
I talked to George Kavaslos about this during my recent session with him, and he says that the um, Aryans are the Orion Nordics, which are reptilian, although they have an angelic quality to them, hence the name Nordics. And um, I wish I remember everything everything Kavaslos told me, but um, just thought I'd point that out uh, to you because you talked a lot about Orion in your uh, presentations, and might be interesting for you to know that the Aryans that David Icke talks about in his books are the Orion Nordics. But uh, moving on, yeah, you, you did that. touch on the grays. Yeah, you did touch on the grays. Um, there's good grays and bad they're grays. They're hybrids. Um, they're the reptilian Nordic hybrids uh, based on the wars of the uh, the Lyrans when they were attacked by the Dracos. That's what produced the Aryans. So what was your question? Yeah, um, yeah about the grays. Um, I believe I heard somewhere that grays um, have a lack of emotion. In the, uh, not all grays are bad, but even the good grays, um, if they do something good, they don't have like a sense of after effect emotion. I don't, I don't know how to describe this because I heard something about grays are lacking something. And um, I don't know if maybe if it is just the bad grays that are lacking some sense of emotion. Like, actually, you know what? Um, maybe it has something to do with you instruct a gray to do something, they will do it. Um, without thinking about it, I mean, there, there's so many different things about the grays that I've heard. We could go on all day, but um, quickly, so I can get this caller a, a chance to speak, um, could you um, give the nuts and bolts of good gray aliens and bad gray aliens and how each one, the many different types of them, are affecting reality on Earth? Well, it, they're very much like humans in the sense that, you know, they're in a tug of war, just like the human soul is between um, – you know, the negative alien agenda and, um, you know, our organic ascension and our sovereign free will and the path of liberation. Um, the, the grays are a little bit different in the sense that they, um, they're advanced on an intellectual level. You know, a lot of them are advanced humans, actually, um, and they are from the future and they have time traveled back. And uh, Dan Burrish, who's a whistleblower, uh, I know a lot of people have heard of him, um, you know, has had a lot of contact with them. And there's, you know, P45s and P52s, which means, you know, one group is 45,000 years into the future and the other one is 52,000 years into the future. One is trying to assist us and the other one's malevolent. Now, when we think of the malevolent ones, these are the ones that are more linked to the global elite and those agendas who went underground or went off planet and then ended up losing their um, soul essence, their emotions, their reproductive organs because of the conditions of things and have time travel back to um, continue this agenda and to use our genetics in order to help their species um, rejuvenate or restore themselves because they're, they're sick. I mean, they're, they're lacking. They can't, you know, produce children. And then the ones that are further into the future that recognize that that agenda is not even going to work have come back to try and help us and to warn us. Um, and so grays very much are future human selves that have come back that have been altered because of, you know, just like we see evolution, you know, animals change based on their environment and the climate. I mean, we, we make slow changes over time based on what we're surrounded by. And we're dealing with radiation, too, and it affected them in the underground, living in underground bases. But then we're also dealing with um, hybridization programs and grays that are produced um, artificially, you know, in labs and people that are abducted to create these babies, these hybrids. And so that's to give them emotionality again. What they're trying to do is restore their species and to make themselves human-like again. But the way they swing, whether it's, you know, here to help us or use us, you know, depends on, you know, the group. And just like any group, you know, like the Pleiadians, the Nordics, there's, there's the benevolent and then there's the ones that are hybrids that, you know, some, you know, swing this way and some swing that way. It depends on your orientation. You know, similar to humans, we, we've got reptilian brains, we've got higher selves, but, you know, we have free will choice. We can decide what we're going to. Same thing with the grays. I mean, we, we have a mixed bag when it comes to them. But the thing is, you know, they're using us to try and rehabilitate themselves because of these shoddy decisions that they're making that we're seeing right now, which is uh, the New World Order agenda. So where do we see that in the future? We see a gray alien race coming back to try and heal their genetics based on those decisions. We also have higher beings that are our higher selves, higher races that weren't affected coming back to help us too, that we're able to get beyond all of this. So we have to look at like, what is our future going down this road? Are we going to become gray aliens? Um, are we going to lose all of this? Are we going to want to time travel back and, and contact our uh, younger selves and use genetics so that we can rehabilitate, so that we can keep this life cycle alive with technology? Or are we going to drop it all now and be on the ascension path and blossom into our real 
extraterrestrial um, uh, inheritance, which is not of a malevolent kind. It's of a, a highly advanced spiritual kind. These grays that are malevolent, you know, I wouldn't even consider them extraterrestrial. I consider them sort of parasitic entities that linger in the fourth dimension, you know, that are desperate. Um, and some, yes, have traveled from the future. And, um, you know, who knows, you know, what, what – there's a lot to all that. I could go on and on and on about the different scenarios, what's going on Mars with all of it. But, you know, same with reptilians. There's seven different species or so. Not all of them are bad. Um, it really depends on your makeup. It depends on what you've bought into. It depends on how bent on survival you are. Is it more important survival of the flesh or survival of consciousness and survival of the soul? Some people think it's more important to enhance the, 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 the physical experience and to stay in this density as we know it and to increase our abilities here. Others know that there's more than this and we can transcend this and we can move beyond it and we can open up the gateways for this earth to be able to um, blossom in her development. And if we don't, then there's going to be a bifurcation, which is happening right now, which is she's going to move on anyway. And what's going to be left behind is this phantom earth, which is an earth that's on a respiratory system, an artificial intelligence system run by these malevolent forces. But not all grays are a part of that agenda. They're kind of the in-between, just like humans are caught in the middle of these cosmic battles. Grays are caught in the middle of these battles as well. Some, you know, have stronger genetics. And, and aren't so much like grays, sort of the empty vessel that will, you know, do whatever they're told. Um, it just depends on, you know, that individual species, just like we notice with souls. Some are highly advanced spiritually, some are almost there, and some are absolutely and totally unconscious. So these are future human versions of ourselves is the best way to look at extraterrestrials, whether they're benevolent or malevolent. You know, we're dealing with a oneness factor here. We're dealing with a no-time scenario. But time has slowed it all down so that we break it into linear terms. But we're all connected, and all these are extensions of ourselves. They're extensions of us. And so that's the way we can look at it and actually make decisions and connect with things you know, that are going to assist us rather than, you know, take us further down. That's why it's very dangerous that people walk around saying there's no negative alien agenda and they're trying to, you know, create people, create scenarios where people can make contact. And it's like, wait a second, do you even know what you're getting into here? You know, the ones that are dealing with Earth um, are dealing with the genetic manipulation and needing and wanting our genetics. The benevolent races aren't really intervening, but they'll certainly um, assist us if we step up to the plate just like our immune system assists us when we change our diet. You know, it increases. It, you know, we have to take the first steps to get the assistance we need in our own lives. It's no different on a macro level. Um, all right. Thanks for that, uh, Phil. And we'll get back to uh, – this is the only call on the board, so we get back to getting information out. But uh, now to moving on to callers, area code 330. You are on the air. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Uh, doing great. Um, what you want to call about? What you call in about? Well, um, I guess uh, 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 first I want to make a point and then I want to ask a question. Um, I kind of find it very interesting that that um, people who were highly evolved on this planet, uh, like Gandhi, uh, like Martin Luther King, and others of those types, um, never spoke of, of, of these extraterrestrials. Extras, these aliens. Extras, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second point is I almost find it fascinating in that we can't even deal with the organized, the, the organized criminal traumatic networks on this planet that are brutalizing good and decent human beings, including children, uh in infancy and as toddlers. So how is it that uh, this is all going to help in the long run when, in fact, we have issues of starvation and homelessness among our own people uh, that is being allowed to happen to destroy good and decent people, that child abuse is off the hook in which now the DSM-5, which is the mental health Bible, if you will, a diagnostic tool, is now making adult to child pedophilia legal, so or normalizing it, and that we have had the U.S. Bishops Conference in every state trying to normalize sexual abuse of children, or at least to minimize the accountability. So my question to you is, what good does it matter if there's advanced civilizations when human beings on this planet can't 
discern the difference between appropriate behavior because when we were all born on this planet, we all were born 100% whole. We were supposed to have free will and free choice about dreams and what we wanted to be. And yet quite a few of us have been denied anything that even looked like it. And we're more in a system of, for lack of better terminology, a slavery race in plain view, hidden in plain view. So based on what your knowledge is, how is, how is it that we're really truly advancing? Thank you for listening, and I'll listen. Okay, um, I'll take this one. How are we really advancing? Well, having our attention on the very topics you talk about is how we're advancing. You know, the only thing about higher civilizations is that we have dormant potential that we're ignoring. Um, but, you know, what what are we really ignoring? I mean, in these advanced civilizations, these civilizations collapsed because the technology was moving faster than the spiritual development, and the spiritual development ended up being attacked and targeted in, in placement of – you know, this technological world that lacks morality and is parasitic and is abusive and is deceptive and is all about enslavement. So what do right, we do with how that? Do we, yep. How do we resolve that when, in fact, and please know, I was trained um, ordained minister in the New Age movement where most of those systems have been hijacked by organized criminal who want to put out that uh, the bogus stuff of, that people contracted to come here to go through what they did. No infant, no toddler contracts being sexually, physically, or psychologically brutalized, let alone technologically brutalized. No one does. No soul before right. well, there, that. There is, there, it, it all you know, really depends on belief systems. I mean, we do have soul please, agreements. Please, I, 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 was, I, I, I was in those systems, and I understood, and I taught it. But the problem was... What it has done in the face of what we believed are supposed to be laws, given organized criminal trauma networks, justification for what they're doing to human beings, for what they're doing to human beings. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's, 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 even, if you, even if you believe in Jesus Christ, and a lot of people are very passionate and committed to that belief system, which I have no problems with, Jesus Christ was not a person who just loved he loved in action. He took significant potential action. And yet most of these people that are doing these crimes against other human beings, they actually see themselves as gods on earth. And, and the question is, when we have so much corruption, and it is corrupt across this country, where we can't even get people held accountable as they're working below the letter of the laws to collapse systems under the auspices of capitalism right I mean, well, this is the thing. look at look at the small numbers of people that are trying to expose them um you know i can speak for myself that you know i'm love in action i'm doing everything i can to expose ritual abuse to expose everything that's going on behind the scenes the underbelly of, of the vatican of the government of everything under the sun to hold these people accountable and yes in the mainstream world yeah, there's not a lot of that happening, and there's a lot of talk about disclosure and this and that, and our priority is to unify, to be a global family, to take care of our children, to protect women, to have the men be protective, not out fighting wars for, you know, just agendas that they don't even understand. I mean, we are sucked into an artificial scenario that's absolutely denying, um, you know, our rights, our, our privileges, our divine birthright, the protection of all that is sacred. All that is sacred has been destroyed and exploited, and it's time for us to stand up and, and, and make this the priority. This is what I'm all about. So what do we do? Hopefully, you know, more people like you and me and, and everybody that's doing the show and everybody that's out there speaking about these subjects, hopefully that will start to ripple out because if we keep looking to these people in our governments and in religion to do something, we're going to be wasting our time because it's up to us. We're the human race that's being affected. We're the ones that want to protect our kids. So we better get up there and start to do that and use our voices. This and is I why I do it. I don't care if it costs me my life. So I do this work. Well, and often, this is what we often have to do. And as, do far is, as, as far as advanced races and, and these hidden things, we have to know the game being played so that we know who's really going to help us and who isn't. But we have to first count on ourselves. That's right, number but, one. But, and, and I educate my kids to educate their friends and – we all have to do all that we can because even Lisa Renee and I are starting on a thing of, of 
you know, really reaching out to the, the children who are abused, you know, ritual abuse, making this more public, making this more known. There's no excuse for it. This is why I've devoted my life to this. So I get it. I get what you're saying. And there's no bigger priority. But all this other stuff we talk about is all interconnected, and that's, that's why it comes up. And, right, um, but they also, these organized criminal trauma networks are also very much in exploiting people's belief systems as well as their superstitions. They they utilize the external technologies, which there's at least a half a dozen or more external technologies, including movie magic and Hollywood cinematography, in which they've now figured out how to overlap it into the unconscious to make people feel like they're seeing aliens or other things. And again, Barry Trower talks yeah, about TV that. Technology, yep, it's connected to artificial intelligence. It's connected to the nanoparticles. It's connected to aspects of blue beam technology that they're still using. Artificial telepathy, false ascended masters, new age deceptions. Everywhere we turn, we're, there's a trap. Whether it looks right. positive or negative, it's a trap. Right. So where do we go from here? We go inside ourselves. We start to think about what it really means to live on a soul level to really connect with other people. You know, forget all this other crap. People got to, you know, step away from it all and really go inside and, and, and remember, you know, things like the nucleus of family, you know, your children, protecting your children, protecting your relationships, forming a deep, you know, relationship with the self, connecting to spirit, connecting to Gaia, and, and being on a path of divine justice, you know, exposing things, you know, being able to share these truths without getting so sucked into the anger and the battle that the person gets drained. You know, we have to do it from a vibration that is going to serve us and assist with raising the vibration because right now it's about, you know, shining the light on everything that's been hidden and then being proactive in the way that we're going to take it upon our hands to be the new structure that's going to protect and serve and abandon the governments that have done nothing but harm us and feed on us. It's Which time that we look to each other to form the new system, not wait for them to figure it out because they're not going to. It's up to us to do it. And, and, and that's why new groups have to be created. You know, I always thought, you know, we need to come up with a hidden group that's going to knock down these walls when there's ritual abuse taking place and bust them. Why aren't there people showing up and knocking down those doors is what I wonder. So I'm all about this, you know. Well, I we, think part we of it is you have to also have more to, passionate. I think part of it is you also have to look at things like the – Himmler, the Hitler Himmler Eichmann study that came over on Operation Paperclip and that was imported and practiced across this country, as well as that was then infiltrated into our colleges, the medical universities, yep. um, and all the way down, in which then look at Jose Delgado with a uh, chip or or even heavy metals. I mean, if you understand the entire concept, while children do not have to necessarily be chipped, the possibility is that there is multiple levels of things in which they have the ability, uh, since the 60s at least, probably even earlier, that uh, you know they know going on. And so they're manipulating people. They're manipulating, forcing, and coercing them to live their lives as these criminals want you to do, only to destroy those who are truly good and decent. So I guess my question is, when do you guys get together and talk about solutions of how to resolve these things? Uh, you know, plans in action, um, things that you are talking about and putting out to let parents know, because again, um, no disrespect to you, but most Americans may not be at the levels you're at. They're looking for the practical things of understanding how children are being abused. Most people don't even believe in ritual torture and abuse because it's been on an ongoing basis in mainstream media totally disregarded as not real because they say where are the victims, where are the where's the proof? They're everywhere. They're and, Darren well, Green Hicks, there's Darren McCollum. I can think of about ten people right now. People you know, it's, it's, it's all out on the Internet. Everything that people need to get in touch with is out on the Internet. Same with all the disinformation that's going to confuse them. Same with all sorts of, you know, solutions that might be actually pulling them out of the fact that, they, that we are the solution. We hold the solution within us. So on a practical level, I think it involves, I mean, I've thought of going on, you know, uh, tours to police academies, to school systems, to wake up the people that are trying to serve and protect humanity that have no idea they're serving dark agendas with some of the things that they're carrying out, with some of the things that they're blind to, that they, they don't realize is happening in the room next door or underground or, you know, right at the airport, you know, the TSA people that have no idea that, 
you know, some, some CIA agents in the next room torturing somebody. You know, we have to start to address the human population, and the human population that is not ready for this needs to open their minds and get over it already. I'm tired of being, like, in the position of, well, what are you going to do? People don't get it. Well, you know what? It's time for people to get it, and it's time for us to look at the people that don't get it and, 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 and compassionately put ourselves in their shoes, work on speaking a language that they can understand, try and help them to understand with the evidence that's presented – um, I do this every day, you know, with family members, with friends, with people that have never heard of this stuff before, and it works. It really does. People are apologizing to me three years later, you know, for bashing me in interviews that now they say, wow, you know, now it makes sense. Now I get it. I'm so sorry for insulting you. We're planting seeds right and left. It's not going to be able to hit somebody in their conscious mind overnight, but the fact is, if we're a resource and we keep putting it out there with love, compassion, and service, and, and really sincere devotion to what we're doing it for, which is for the protection of our humanity, for our liberation, and for the betterment of Mother Earth and, and her just process, um, you know, people are going to catch on because what else are they going to do? They're going to turn on the news and see another false flag, another lie coming out of Obama's mouth, and what, they're going to ignore, you know, people like us that are raising kids that wake up to this stuff every day? I mean, I come from a presidential family. You know, it's like... Whatever, you know, people have got to start to look at and, and wake up to what they're seeing in the news and be more insulted by that than the ones that are doing their best to, to, to share information that, that might be uncomfortable, but it's necessary. And there's got to be a flip in that perspective. You know, instead of being called crazy for pointing out chemtrails, you know, people have to understand that it's delusional to think that something's not going on when this is happening every day in our sky. Well, and but I not think... not to respond to fear. Uh, uh, to respond I, I think it's also how very to important. Our body. I think it's also very important that we don't just um, point out the faults of this presidency because this stuff has been going on for decades in the presidency. That's why we talk about galactic history, you know, and it goes in and, and the, the hidden projects that are behind, you know, what makes a president president. This is not about creating an us or them or a blame thing. It's about understanding what we're giving our power away to so that we can bring the power back to ourselves and we can assist the souls that are being manipulated and used as pawns like our president and not make them the enemy because they need our help. You know, there's a parasitic force that's at work that's preying upon the people that we see in the public sphere that are acting as our leaders. And if we keep creating this us and them, we're always going to be polarized. We need to, you know, really work on empowering ourselves, exposing these truths, helping the souls that are stuck in those agendas. And then the, the few that remain that are the ones behind it won't have anything left to feed on. But I, I, I love what you shared, and, and all these points are so important. And, and we're trying to cover every angle we possibly can, from the practical to the metaphysical to the physical body and how to prepare the physical body for all that's happening, both negative and positive, um, for, for us to be able to be empowered as the alchemists. Um, and all those points are important. And that's why I didn't go to Mars, because you know why? Why go someplace when, when, when this place needs help? Just like you said, we've got priorities that need to be addressed before we go off into some other experience. And that's why I refuse to go, because my priority is, you know, protecting those that are innocent, protecting a vulnerable planet that is nothing but unconditional love, that has provided nothing but resources for us. Those are my priorities. And um, I absolutely am right there with you, um, you know, doing the best I can with, with what I've got in my own tool shed <laughs> to uh, do, do the best I can with it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, caller, thanks for uh, calling. By the way, I seem to have a really bad habit of not asking callers for their names. I mean, names are, uh, in the end, meaningless because we're all infinite consciousness. But just for the sake of courtesy, can I get your name? Sure, it's Dorothy. Dorothy. All right, Dorothy, thank you very much for calling in. Uh, I do hope to um, hope you call in sometime in the very near future. Mm -hmm. Take care now. You too. Later. Well, uh, we don't actually have any more callers. I hope somebody does uh, get a chance to call in because uh, I always take calls in the uh, last 45 minutes, maybe sometime for some variety's sake. I'll take calls at the beginning. But uh, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it is Dr. Dream's turn in regards to asking questions. So, uh, Dr. Dream, let's uh, go on to the subject of crystals. Um, I'm going to guess you do some work with crystals, and I'm actually uh, – looking when I get a chance uh, to get some crystals myself, uh, maybe even wear a chakra necklace around me, because uh, even though everybody's got a little bit of infinite consciousness in them, no one can deny that crystals, and you've got to treat your crystals properly for them to be uh, able to help you to the best, because in a sense, they are a living thing. Uh, treat your crystals well, they will treat you well. You can get high off of crystal energy, if that makes sense. So uh, 
Do you have any bit of advice for anybody that wants to get high off of crystal energy? <laughs> I love that. And as you were talking, I took um, – I have four crystals in my pocket. One is a piece of kyanite. Um, kyanite is one of the two minerals in the kingdom that is widely accepted as being um, only able to hold positive energy. The other one is citrine. I have a piece of um, azurine which um, in addition to people describing it as uh, black tourmaline on steroids, it is described as having the ability to make all things right. So when I first read that about um, azurine and started working with that, um, I jokingly said to Laura, you know, we're selling all the crystals and we're getting a big chunk of azurine. And then I've got um, a piece of garnet, which is re-energizing, regenerating, revitalizing, and cleansing and a um, raw ruby, which um, is all about uh, protection and, and some other things. And so um, we're, I, I'm big on, on the tools, obviously. I mean, everything I do is pretty much multiple modality. And what I like about it is, um, you know, they all hold different energies, and then it gives us a point of focus. And when we focus our attention and intention – on something like the fact that, gee, I'm carrying kyanite in my pocket, and, and that means that, you know, it's repelling um, negative energy away from me, I'm even adding more of an energetic to that. And that's one of the things that that I love about it. I mean, we do um, sessions where we, we put uh, crystal grids around people and on their bodies and everything, and, and the crystals that are called forth to be placed in certain areas um, really tell a story. And and then that's that's what I do after my intuition and pendulum and everything has shown me where to put the crystals. Um, I go ahead and, and tell the story from my perspective. Of course, once I've told the story of why the garnet wanted to be placed near the heart and why this wanted to be there and this and that, based on what I know about crystal energy, then it's up to the person then to take that information and do a little more connecting of the dots. And so again... For people that are looking for crystals and things like that, um, there's, there's two really incredible ways to start. One is to go to a local crystal store, and you can look at all the really nice, expensive crystals and things like that. And if your budget can manage it, phew, hallelujah. But also look at the tumbled crystals. And they still carry the energy. They can be very inexpensive. You can get a bag of tumbled stones for $5 or something. Um, and, and citrine can be in there and, and amethyst and things like that. And just kind of see what you're drawn to. Um, the other way of doing it would be to back into it and, and know what you're looking for. Gee, I'm looking for something that's all about positive energy. And then researching what crystals, you know, type into Google, what crystals are all about positive energy and seeing what crystals um, show up. And then just kind of opening yourself up to – to learning about it. I don't go, I mean, I go no more than two days um, without reading in one of my crystals, crystal books about a particular crystal or about a particular um, ailment or discomfort or challenging situation or emotion or something like that and what crystal would be good for it. So I'm a huge believer. Like I say, I carry crystals on me all the time. I carry essential oil. I have at least one essential oil with me at all times. Um, I like to be able to shift the energy in like a moment, in like, boom, the snap of a finger. And let's face it. I mean, we're brought up in a culture that's all about I want it and I want it now. Okay? You know, we weren't brought up in a culture where it's like, all right, you're 15 now. You go up to that cave and you spend two months there and you come back and you tell us what you've learned, you know, I mean, where there's like the real soul searching and really taking the time for it. So I embrace how I was raised and there are just times that I will pick up a um, amethyst crystal to, to feel a sense of calmness right away. Now, could I do that without the amethyst crystal? Absolutely. But the tools are fun. They, they're a nice point of focus. And, um, I mean, all of us here um, at, at, at our house have um, little crystal grids set up and, and things like that. And we sometimes bring them all out at once and, and do a big grid or do a little ceremony. And um, 
it's just fun. I'm all about these things being fun. You know, we'll bring we'll bring out the tuning fork sometimes and just, you know, I'll just sit there and, and we'll just listen to the to the different tones or I'll be in my office and a client won't be there yet. I'll just sit there and, and do a tuning fork on myself for five minutes and just bringing myself and, and my my resonant frequency into a balance. You know, and sometimes I'm a very high frequency person. Sometimes I want to like tone down my energy a little bit. You know, and that's when I'll grab the lavender and the amethyst. Sometimes I just want to amp it up. And, you know, that's how I get the peppermint out. And, and depending on what I'm looking to really powerhouse up, you know, maybe selenite working with my third eye and crown chakra. But, but most of all, you know, really allow yourself that childlike sense of wonderment with crystals. They're of Gaia. They're of source. They're of God. And, and essential oils. Always go, I mean, we're huge fans of doTERRA, and I can consult anyone about essential oils, and I'll just put it out there. If you go to drdream.com, drdream.com forward slash schedule, people can schedule a 15-minute no-charge um, phone call with me to talk about crystals or essential oils or the nature of reality or whatever it is they want to talk about. I, I'm, I'm very interested in making myself available to to assist people awesome um i'll see if i can maybe get that um, word out to full and uh by the way we got about 13 minutes left i'd like to take the last couple of minutes, two minutes or so to uh uh prepare everybody for next week's show and everything but um laura um i guess maybe you'll uh finish us off i mean if i can get dr dream on again great but uh i wanted to touch on the whole thing that Dolores Cannon is probably maybe the foremost uh, uh, front person in this whole idea of there being a second Earth. She talked about how in 2003 um, there was this formation of a second Earth that exists now, and um, that Earth will be the 5D Earth that we'll be going into. And she says, she's one of the people that says when we go into 4D, we'll go straight into 5D because the difference between 3D and 4D is uh, 4D, there is no time, sensation of time, since time was always an illusion to begin with, we'll just go straight into 5D. Well, that's what she says. But um, this second Earth thing, I don't actually hear many other people talk about it in the way she talks about, about there being a second Earth that it started to split off with our Earth in 2003, and this will be the Earth that we live on in 5D, and the people that don't want to ascend and aren't ready for the ascension will stay on this Earth. I mean, is there truth to that, or can you elaborate on that, and maybe even elaborate on why it is that some people say we'll be going into 5D instead of 4D? Well, the reason we'd be going into 5D instead of 4D is because 4D is kind of a mess. We're dealing with disincarnate souls. We're dealing with, you know, lower astral entities. We're dealing with just like a huge mess of things, and so it's not really an advanced place. Um, it's, 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 yes, a higher, you know, dimension as far as the abilities, um, and it being not in such a heavy density, but it's still what is behind the heavy density that's here in this 3D. I mean, it all steps down. And so above that in 5D, it's, it's a lot clearer. The duality is, is, is not so polarized. It's more about learning the balance of compassion and wisdom, um, versus, you know, this density, which is all about you know, learning about good and evil, which is a lot more extreme. Um, and, and, and that's why we sort of transverse that. As far as how things are going to look or what others have said, um, you know, I don't really research a lot of other people's work. I, I tend to come from my own truth, and then I, I like to see who else out there agrees by putting in that, you know, kind of information. Um, I mean, you could call it a new earth, but that's almost like, oh, I mean, the way I see it is that we um, have been, reconstructing um, the portals and stargates that go from this particular density into the higher um, earth densities that we used to be a part of, uh, Tara, when we were in uh, densities four, five, and six. And then there's the Gaia dimensions that are even above that, seven, eight, and nine. And then beyond that, we're getting into light bodies. We're getting into, um, you know, the energy matrix and uh, into the sound fields and the light fields and then source. Um, so, you know, we're, we're all – souls that are experiencing this journey. We're all at different levels and it's going to be different for every single one of us. Um, you know, there's, there's a particular shared process in this 3d reality because of the density is such, but now because it's a time of the natural stargates opening and we're in the stellar activation cycle, there's going to be a lot more um, 
individual paths that are kind of branching out and doing their own thing, and there's going to be some collective pods and groups and soul families, and then some that are still in agreement to stay in this particular low density and are just going to be dealing with 3D, 4D, but more the 4D that's now running the show. Um, 5D is really much more of a mess than people can imagine. It doesn't mean that um, it's it's not going to be feasible, but the 5D timeline got majorly um, hijacked in a lot of ways, uh, particularly the Pyramid of Giza is the big hot spot for that, um, and the Super Soldier programs, and some um, timelines are already like in the astral um, connected to 5D that haven't fully manifested yet, similar to like knowing 9-11 is going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. We're in, you know, a lot of humans are on that trajectory, you know, moving in that direction, but many of us aren't because we're multidimensional beings and there's far other options than that. So there's two different levels to the 5D reality. Is it a new earth? Well, it's kind of an ancient earth that used to be a higher dimension. Um, it's not like, you know, the womb of uh, the galactic core has just birthed a whole new planet. Um, we're linking you know, our consciousness with, you know, our origins and what we used to be. And so in a sense, it's a new earth. It's going to have a new set of circumstances than the old one because it was almost, you know, destroyed. There has, you know, been a lot of rehabilitation projects from the guardian races, from the angelic lines, and, you know, some of us that, you know, have been, you know, focused on this kind of work. It just depends on your perceptions. This is the thing. <clears throat> when we're dealing with timelines, dimensions, the creative imagination, our own soul essence, and our own divine power – it's not going to look the same for everybody. We're not going to see it the same way. But the one thing that I can say that is probably similar for all of us is that we have the potential to expand beyond where we are right now. We have the potential to stay stuck. And when we expand beyond, our vibration finds a vibratory match with a physical experience. And then it, becomes, uh, then it can become non-physical depending on how much we allow ourselves to drop our attachments to certain densities and dimensions, but it takes a lot of advancement and a lot of, like, you know, lack of ego and a lot of uh, focus on something that we're not really used to. It could take, you know, a while. We're not going to wake up avatars overnight. Um, but we're on course to go in that direction. Um, and, and, and like I said, there's, there's other traps and directions that even in 5D can, can, can reroute a soul, and they're not going to be able to move on, you know, from 5D. They might actually end up going back. Um, into 3D, depending. You know, any scenario can play out, just like we can, anything we can imagine under the sun, you know, exists somewhere in this universe or, or exists somewhere on Earth. You know, the thing is, you know, when people are disbelievers in something, it's, it's shocking, you know, because everything is possible. The, the whole point is, though, what do you choose to empower? What do you choose to believe in? And what is your vibration? What choice are you making to raise your vibration? The rest of it kind of live and let live. Let other people have their beliefs and their experiences. We don't need to be in charge of other people's experiences in that way. Oh, that's not true, or, or you're a liar. Well, it's only important to call them out when it directly affects our lives, you, you know, like when governments are lying to us or when our parents or our partners are. But when it comes to other people's past, we're all on a path of spiritual liberation. Spiritual liberation means that we have the freedom to be artists with energy and experience things that we can't even really fathom right now. And yes, it has different dimensional levels, but beyond 5D is where the real liberation starts to come in and where we're not really dealing with technology. We're in that Merkaba. We are the UFO. We are the vessel of consciousness that's able to come and go from the physical as we choose. We have a little ways to go before we're liberated on that level. And 5D is not as clear as, as we'd like it to be, but there's, you know, definitely the portals are still opening from 3, 4, 5 and beyond if we stay on a particular route, but along the way, there's going to be a lot of traps, um, even into 5D that might, like I said, reroute us. So one could call it a new earth energy. I call it higher earth energies, but a lot of it does have to do with similarities to where we've been before. But just like the earth is different than what it was, you know, millions of years ago. So are these, you know, higher dimensional earths. Nothing is ever going to be the same. There's, there's history repeats itself in the same way that, you know, patterns repeat themselves, but not in a fixed way, not in the way that um, we're going to be experiencing. We're, we're entering a lot of new territory. So I'm not one to predict. I'm one to just be the experiencer and just to use my right and left brain to, you know, fill in a lot of dots. And, um, and then, you know, the fact that I feel I've traveled into the future and into the past and I'm very embodied in the now, these are the kind of insights that come to me and what I sort of, you know, the, the the things that I, I determine, you know, after hearing people like Dolores or looking at Lisa Renee's work, but I don't delve into it to the point where I can even say, oh, okay, this is what they're saying, except for maybe Lisa, because we have like this cosmic sisterhood and we're just really on the same page in a lot of ways. Dolores, I, I resonate with completely and totally, but I probably would word it a little differently.
Okay, so in a sense, it is a point of view issue. As Obi Wan Kenobi told Luke Skywalker, many of the truths we cling to depend very heavily on our uh, point of view. And uh, by the way, I just want to point out, since you said the fourth dimension is um, the lower part of it has negative entities, I think it's just for kicks. It's worth pointing out that George Kavaslos asserts that the uh, malevolent reptilians, not the benevolent ones, the, but, but the malevolent ones, and also malevolent greys, actually come from the second dimension of consciousness and not the lower fourth. And, and But then he said, but they impose their will upon us, their malevolent will, under the guise of lower fourth dimensional entities. If I ever get the chance to speak to him about that, maybe he could explain the science behind how a second dimensional being uh, imposes its will under the guise of a fourth dimensional being. But uh, that might be something well, that people they, want they to look into. They manipulate our into. chakras, and so they exist in the first dimension. They li- they live underground. They live. In, I mean, they, they they journey not just. I mean, but they but they. There's a dream warfare program going on, and it hits us in the astral. These beings are in the astral. It's not a very clear plane, but that's not the only place they exist. And they work through our lower chakras. That's where they keep us, you know, locked in this lower density is through our lower chakras. And some of the scenarios we we hit on the astral and some of the tinkering that happens is in that dimension, but doesn't mean that that's where they, you know, hang out or originate. Actually, a lot of them are much higher, and some of them, you know, were put underground, even the Lemurians helped them to build underground caverns, you know, way back when. So it's hard to really track it. And, you know, George has taken back some of the stuff he said in the past. I think he's pretty right on, but um, a lot of his information ends up changing um, over time. So, like, if he sticks with this, you know, that'd be great. Um, you know, but, but like, these these energies are everywhere. We're multidimensional, and we have a connection with all of them because of our inner circuitry and the inner architecture, the archetypes that we all hold, the elements we hold, the fact that we're made of all these races. We have bits and pieces of the whole of creation within us. It just happens to be in the fourth dimension, in the lower astral, is where we tend to hit the heavy veil, and we tend to divert our route back to the earth density in fear and in a lower vibration than being able to move through the astral and into the ethereal because we see it for what it is and we're able to not get caught in the traps that are set, um, you know, in the astral, you know, just in dream time when we wake up exhausted or we're, you know, dealing with, you know, a lot of nonsense and garbage, you know, that, that makes us wake up and feel the heaviness, you know, but we can dream and transcend that and move into the ethereal and actually, you know, start to thin the veils by being able to reach dimensions that are beyond the astral that those entities do play around in, but they're not just there. I do agree with that. Okay. Uh, thanks for filling us in on that. And, uh, we've only got two minutes, 20 seconds left. So, uh, loved having you guys on as much as I would love to have you on again. There are a lot of other people on planet earth who deserve the chance to come on my show. So expect <laughs> to hear from me, but don't expect it to be in the near future. Cause I got to give everybody a chance. There's a lot of people out there who deserve a, some glory on my radio show because they've done a lot. So uh, it was a pleasure to have you guys on. I'll see you in L.A. for the uh, in 5D conference, and I'll try not to bog you down with too many questions there, but I'm sure something's going <laughs> to come to mind. And uh, do your best to get to wake up humanity because I uh, want to make Talek's uh, statement come true that we'll ascend into 4D Earth uh, or 5D Earth uh, that time. You know, the sooner the better. No question about that. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having us. We really enjoyed it. We really did. Thank you so much. You You're welcome. Take care. See you around later. So, uh, so folks, um, that was a great show. Loved it very much. Loved having them on. And uh, I do plan on uh, having Jim Delacoli, uh, astrologer par excellence. He uh, seems to know his stuff. He's been on In 5D Radio three times. I've listened to all the shows. I actually called into all the shows. If anybody wants to become familiar with Jim Delacoli's work, um, I would recommend those uh, interviews he did on In 5D Radio. You can find those on the In 5D YouTube channel. Uh, give Greg, Greg Prescott a lot of credit for uh, waking up humanity. So, uh, oh, they say here in the uh, chat room, Lauren, Dr. Dream, we have another show at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time at www.awakeinthedreamradio.com. That's Awake in the Dream Radio. Awake, the word awake, the word in, I-N, the word the, the word dream, the word radio.com. So if anybody wants to listen to that, by all means, I'm sure uh, they'll cover a lot of things I didn't cover on this show. So uh, namaste, everybody. See you next week with uh, astrologer par excellence, Jim Del Cole, Panther Jim, they call him. Namaste, everybody.